It is such a great feeling to be here. Can we please give it up for the LinkedIn team and the cast and the crew, the people who really made this happen and brought all of us together. Thank you so much. And hi to everybody who is tuning in on live stream. We're so happy to have you joining us. My name is Lisa Lee, and I lead diversity, inclusion, and corporate social responsibility at Squarespace. We are a platform that empowers millions of people with creative ideas to succeed. But we also know that individuals without a team, without a community, aren't successful if we don't do it together. That's why I am super thrilled to be joining Elaine Welteroth um, to be talking about how do we create community and how do we give voice to the underrepresented communities uh, that are hovering all around us. So what do I say about Elaine? Um, she is an incredible spark of joy. She is uh, an award-winning journalist, author, and she was also the former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. And under her watch, Teen Vogue transformed into this publication, this platform that really civically engaged audiences that we didn't think could be possible. And not to mention, she is also the youngest editor-in-chief and the second African-American to be named in that role in Condé Nast's 107-year-old history. She is also a lover of boomerangs, she loves to tap dance. So please put your hands together and help me welcome Elaine onto the stage. We match for you guys. I'm, yeah, this was, yeah, not, this was intentional. <laughs> Hi everyone. All right. Hi everyone. It's more like it. I think people had their coffee this morning, right? Okay, so I wrote a haiku for you. Oh, did you? I did, do you wanna hear it? I feel honored, let's hear it. Okay. Elaine, cool auntie, mm. you mirror the fire that burns to show our brightness. Ooh, <laughs> that touched my heart. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone give her a round of applause. <laughs> I like I that. I think I have a career in poetry writing, maybe. So, so many things that we could say about you and you know, obviously your bio and all of that, but why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about your upbringing, your background, and how did you get into publishing? Sure, so I'm actually from California. It's good to be back. Ooh, um, shout out to Cali. Except shout out to Northern California. Where are the Bay Area people at? <laughs> I like it. So I'm from a very small town in Northern California called Newark, not Newark, New Jersey. Wow, okay, one. Well, I've heard, heard of it. I heard one Wow, there's there. like one over there, I see you. <laughs> um, and I grew up in a very sort of eccentric household. My mother is an African-American gospel singer. My father is this German Irish, like acoustic guitar playing dude. And my brother is a punk rocker, um, who's actually here today, wherever you are. Hi, Eric. Um, but so you can say like I sort of came out of the womb into a very diverse um, household, but my community was uh, predominantly white. And so I got very used to being what Shonda Rhimes calls an FOD, which is first, only, and different. I was usually the only person who looked like me in my classrooms, on my sports teams. And um, you know, I think I developed a real love for magazines from that place of wanting to see myself represented somewhere. And so my mom always had Essence magazines in the house and it was really my only exposure to this broader world where there are sophisticated, you know, career-driven black women doing amazing things in the world who are also stylish. And I just poured over those pages and I would make collages and I look back now and I think those were definitely my first magazines. Um, and, but you know, as they say, you can't be what you can't see. And I didn't grow up in a place where there were many people who had big dreams that took them to big cities like New York City. So I, I really, and I had no connections in New York City or you know, in, with anyone in the media. 
Um, so it took a while for me to sort of wake up to my own dream of wanting to be a magazine editor because I never saw myself in, the, in that role. Um, and it wasn't until sort of the end of college that I ended up stumbling across this story in a magazine that struck me and something told me to Google the woman who wrote it. And I found her bio, her name was Harriet Cole, and she, I fell in love with her career trajectory, 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 thank you. Coffee, I need, it needs to kick in. Um, <laughs> But I fell in love with what she was able to do in her career, and she was a black woman who spent her first 11 years of her career as a magazine editor. And I, and I, I loved the way that she showed up as so authentically in her work. And, and I just decided to stalk her. So I called and- We've all done that. Yeah. We've all done that know, here. I was incessant. <laughs> and eventually she was nice enough to give me an informational interview. Um, which just sort of cracked open the possibilities for me. And I'm so indebted to her and grateful for, to her for giving me that moment, but even, even, it gets even better. Five months later, she called me back out of the blue and said that there was an opportunity to work with her on set in California. She needed to find someone who could work for her for $250 for the day, and I said, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a cover story with Serena Williams, you guys. She didn't mention that. And so, needless to say, I was stoked, and I, it was the first time that I had felt like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I wanna do. And I was lucky enough to get hired on the spot, and she kind of plucked me out of, from obscurity, and um, I started under her. She was the editor-in-chief of Ebony. I moved to New York, and my whole career unfolded from there. Amazing, yeah. And I know that, you know, you and I have talked about this being almost like a fairy tale of a career story. Totally. But I think behind every single one of us here, we can all relate to that in some ways, that somebody at one point gave us that opportunity, right? Whatever that opportunity is, and we didn't make it here by ourselves. Of course. So I want to go deep with you. Let's go there, Oprah. All right. <laughs> Let's go there. Ad Color is this conference that um, I attended earlier uh, in September, and um, it's this amazing conference, which I know you're familiar with. Tiffany R. Warren, shout out to her and the team for putting on just such an incredible um, gathering and community of people. And the theme of Ad Color this year was the moment of truth. Mm. And, you know, going through that conference the entire time, I was thinking about what is my moment of truth? And I think a big part of that for me was uh, realizing that at a younger age, when I realized that I was also an FOD, mm -hmm. um, you know, this Asian woman who uh, grew up in South Africa, had parents who didn't really give us a reason of why we moved there, <laughs> even till this day, um, and um, somebody who's just like so extremely passionate about diversity and inclusion work, um, even though a lot of the times Asians are not included in that conversation. Um, I, it's starting to change. Yeah, it's starting to change, which is really important, but um, having that moment of truth of, well, you know what? If we're gonna be an FOD, then let's lean all the way into it. Mm -hmm. Let's really embrace that and figure out what to do with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear from you what has been, I'm sure there has been so many mm -hmm. moments of truth, but what is one that stands out to you as it relates to the conversation that we're having today? Mm -hmm. It, it's such a good question, um, and I love I love the framing of it because it makes you really think about your work as more than just work, but your life's work, right? And I think my moment of awakening, um, or what do you uh, moment, moment of, of truth. moment of truth? Oh, I love that moment of awakening. Moment of awakening. Too. Um, Oprah says aha moment, which mm -hmm. I like as well. But it, it probably was the moment when I first saw my name in a headline mm. when I got my first big job at Teen Vogue. You know, at that point, it was 2012, pre-Woke America, I just was a girl who got a job, who worked really hard and got the job. And then I saw in headlines, Elaine Welteroth becomes first black beauty director in Condé Nast history. And then, years later, in 2016, Elaine becomes second ever black editor-in-chief in Connie Nass history. And, and youngest. And, and then the youngest. So it's like, it's sort of, it surprised me. No one, I didn't sign up for the job of the first or the only. I, I, 
I just was a girl who got a job, right? But, and I think up until that point, like many people of color, women, anyone who considers themselves other or mi the minority, I was, I, I, I was dealing with what I call assimilation syndrome. I was attempting to fit in, to shrink my hair, to change the way I spoke, to not necessarily draw attention to my race um, as a way of advancing in my career, as a way of building trust and credibility and climbing the ladder. And I think that we're all sort of told, taught that in subconscious, subliminal ways. And so what that moment did for me is it made me realize that no matter what I do, my race is gonna walk in the door before I am, every time. No matter how I wear my hair, no matter how I speak, no matter what ideas that I share. And it was an important moment for me to just recognize for once in my career that what makes me different is actually my superpower. Because I have an opportunity to bring to this role and to bring to this table, you know, we talk about having a seat at the table, I was suddenly given a seat at the table that no one who's ever looked like me or came from where I came from has ever had an opportunity to speak. And so what was I gonna do with that? And I, I just felt the weight of it, but I also felt energized by it. It was like I saw my soul, there was a social responsibility that came with this job. Um, and I leaned all the way into it, as Cheryl Sandberg says, I leaned into my otherness. And I think the lesson there for me, and I think for anyone in this room, is like to bring more of yourself to the work because it, that is what's transformative. Hiding behind the guise of assimilating um, only gets you so far. I think I didn't really crack, crack open um, my career and, and I couldn't have transformed or helped, be, or to, I couldn't have contributed uh, to the transformation of Teen Vogue and the way that I had, had I not first recognized that I needed to bring more of my authentic self to the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially you were saying that in order for us to be able to do that for our organizations, we have to start here, right? 100%. And, um, you know, one really interesting uh, sort of icebreaker that I went through recently during a workshop is somebody asking us to close our eyes and just think about the seven people in your life that you would call um, if you needed to be bailed out of jail, right? Like kind of just, let's take a second, think about the seven people in your network, right? Who would you call? And now that you have these seven people roughly in mind, what are their gender? Mm. What are their race? Uh, what's their ability status? Did everybody go to college? And the reason why this exercise, this very tiny exercise was so powerful is because the moderator said, how do we expect to bring inclusion into our workspaces if there's no inclusion in our own lives, mm. right? And I think that kind of a awakening moment for mm. you um, allowed you to really then step forward and then say, okay, this is what I envision um, Team Vogue could be. Absolutely, and also it helped me ask the question of what are the stories that only I can tell? Mm -hmm. What are the perspectives that only I can bring? And what are the ways that I can champion communities of color and people who are in marginalized communities that maybe never had the opportunity to, to have their voices heard? And I think that was the beginning of a, of, a, of a very big shift for me in my career and on the team as a result. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as okay, so here is a confession. <laughs> I subscribed to Teen Vogue for many years, even though I was not Woo! the targeted demographic. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about that because I want to read you some headlines um, as it pertains to your time at um, Teen Vogue. Mm. Uh, let's see here. How Teen Vogue's Elaine Welteroth is shaking up expectations for a new generation of young women. Mm. Elaine Welteroth, who shook up Teen Vogue, says diverse newsrooms are vital. So under your leadership, Teen Vogue went through what I would call, and I think what many people in this room would call a, a transformation. Mm. Uh, and it, um, it started, I mean, I remember uh, the kind of very moment that Teen Vogue was just everywhere. Mm. People started talking about it and said, wow, uh, Teen Vogue is doing the hard hitting investigative journalism that we needed to see. Mm. 
What are some of the examples that you can offer this audience around how you were able to make that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what were some of the choices that you made? Um, and, uh, you know, even shifting the, the players inside the room, yeah. um, right? One of the, the quotes that you gave that I thought was so powerful is, in order for you to change the story, you have to change the storytellers. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear more about how you were able to do that. Mm. How much time do you have? Well, let's see. <laughs> we can talk about this all day. Um, well, thank you. That, I mean, that's very flattering. But I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, the world loves a headline that, and the world loves the idea that there's this idea of an overnight success, right? Um, and Teen Vogue was very much not that. And I'm so excited to be here in this room today to talk about some of the changes behind the scenes that never made headlines that helped us arrive at a place where we could do more meaningful work. And it really did start with changing the, the players um, and also changing the culture internally. Um, and it took time. I mean, I was at Teen Vogue for about six years. Uh, and five years, five of those years were sort of under the radar. And then there was this big peak. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's important that we do talk about the fact that you have to change the storytellers in order to change the story if your goal is authentic representation. Mm -hmm. Because at a time like this, I think the terms diversity and inclusion have become buzzwords that we throw around, that make us feel good, but we don't really know sometimes what that really means. Mm -hmm. And I think that especially in this data-driven world that we live in, sometimes we lose sight of um, the power of just human instincts. And we, we forget that the issue of diversity and inclusion is a human issue. Absolutely. And we, we, we need to look at it through a human lens. And, and so a lot of the insights that myself and other people on the team arrived at that helped us transform this brand came from just listening, observing, asking hard questions, having hard conversations. They didn't necessarily um, come from the data. Um, you know, when I inherited this brand, it was a beauty and fashion magazine for teens. But we saw that there was white space to fill. When I looked online, we did what we, what we got Teen Vogue called social listening. And really it was just stalking our readers online and, and the thought leaders that they follow and seeing that they're talking about so much more than just what's on their bodies. They're talking about their identities. They're talking about the issues in the world that affect them. They're talking about intersectional feminism. And they're talking about LGBTQ equality and all of these issues that were so much more multifaceted. And, and we realized that this is the most diverse generation of young people that has ever existed. And this is also the most connected and informed generation. And I think we all could see very clearly upon introspection that we were underserving them. And I think we, I realized I, I wanted to be a home for all of their identities, all aspects of their identities to be celebrated. But how do you do that? You know, like DeRay McKesson, who's an activist, that he came to speak at Condé Nast to all of the leaders of the brands one time. And he said this, and it stuck with me. Um, he said, we aren't born woke there are moments of awakening for each of us. And I love that quote. Um, although the word woke itself is so over, overused and it's like very 2016, I think that I, the idea that the idea- If you're so using it, it's fine, you get a pass. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, don't overuse it, you know, use it sparingly. But what, what I loved about it was this idea that, you know, wokeness doesn't work like a light switch. You don't just turn it on, flip it on, and say, I got this, I'm woke. It's a process of unlearning what you've been taught. It's a process of intentionally seeing beyond your privilege and to see the injustices that face people um, and communities that may not affect you. And learning how to better service those communities, to be allies for those communities, and also to start within. You know, we all, we, we talk about changing the world so much, but I think the most important thing that we can do is look inside of our own lives, our organizations, our offices, um, to make sure that the, 
the team that you're building and the environment that you're cultivating is, is one of belonging and inclusivity and that it reflects the audience you're trying to reach. And for us, that meant it, it's not enough to just put a girl of color on, on our cover or to just shoot a plus size girl in fashion. Um, we really had to make sure that we were changing our practices and that we were changing who was on the team. And I think that is what really led us to success. I, you know, when I, w one thing I, I have to say is that it, there was a team that was put together. It was myself, at 29, biracial girl, you know, with all this big hair, let's give her the job, with this 20, I think, six-year-old um, gay guy from Boston who was not from a fashion background, who was leading our digital team, and then a 40-year-old French woman who was raised very traditional fashion background, um, who was the creative director, and we were sort of put together and it was sort of like, let's back up and see what happens. And I, I like to say it's like one of the biggest diversity and inclusion experiments in the history of modern media, because Teen Vogue, like many magazines, was in a very challenging time where you know, print subscriptions were down, we were in a bit of an identity crisis um, with you know, losing our point of difference. And, you know, there was the rise of social media and the internet. Why do you need a brand like Teen Vogue? And we had to answer that question. And so I don't think that there were high hopes for, for the brand, if I'm completely candid. And so we got these jobs, and it was sort of like, good luck. Mm -hmm. And within a year, we saw our print subscriptions jump 400%. And we saw our digital um, footprint grow from 2 to 12 million. We were able to reach and cultivate relationships, meaningful, add value to these meaningful relationships with marginalized communities. And it was sort of like, no one saw that coming. But the way that we arrived at that was first looking inside of our newsroom and changing the complexion of our team, and then changing the conversations that we were having in order to change the work that we were, that, we, that was coming out of our, our brand. Um, and luckily we did it under the radar. We didn't have to ask for permission, we really just kind of asked for forgiveness. And then when it worked, it sort of became, um, it, it was a bit of a surprise for all of us. We took a lot of risks. And, and when it worked, I think it became a case study for why diverse leadership is so important and why it's so important to cultivate um, teams where there's a sense of belonging and people can bring more of themselves to the work because it, it results in innovation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that you talked about the human instinct portion, because I think this audience here, I think we all work for companies that will call ourselves data-driven, right? That we are uh, really into data, we are really into analytics, we analyze everything. But I usually um, always say that you don't need to look at a whole bunch of graphs and charts to know what your office looks like and what perspectives are lacking. Um, it's not uncommon that, you know, I would go into a meeting and then uh, halfway through the presentation, the um, senior leaders will say, huh, I wonder how um, the employee stats look uh, in terms of our technical versus non-technical workforce. Mm. Okay, well, we have that, here you go. Uh, I wonder how things would look different if we applied age to it. Okay, here you go. And it just, you know, I think people in DNI roles get put in this really weird position of chasing the data. Mm. And at some point, we really just have to stop and go, it doesn't really matter how you slice or dice the data. The fact is, you have X percentage of underrepresented people in your company, and you know that. And when we start to overly intellectualize the data, we've, we've lost people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I love that you said that, and you know, let's talk a little bit more about like the hiring aspects of things and changing the the makeup of the people who are um, putting forward the stories, mm -hmm. um, because I think one of the really interesting um, and really cool articles that you know we saw coming out of Teen Vogue was around um, culture appreciation, mm. and that was um, a piece, and I'll let. Um, you tell a little bit more about it. Um, but that was something where you center the storytellers. Mm. Um, and I think when we talk so much about diversity and inclusion, um, 
we talk about it, yes, absolutely, in the terms of that it's the right thing to do, and it absolutely is. Uh, but we forget, exactly to your point, the innovation that comes out of that, mm -hmm. right? Without a diverse and inclusive audience or workforce and so on and so on, every stage along the way, you miss out on these really important stories mm -hmm. that reach people mm -hmm. and people want to hear. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Um, yeah, I always say it's, you know, diversity and inclusion is more than just something nice to talk about. It is really a business imperative, especially in a day, an age like this one, especially if you, if you want to be a competitor in a global economy, you have to open up your eyes and like say, do we, are we reflecting that global economy internally? And so, you know, so two, two part, it's a two part question. I think the first part regarding um, hiring, we set the intention that we wanted to create a masthead where there was someone on it that anyone we were hoping to reach could point to and say, I see myself in that person. And you know, Harvard Business Review did a story about how diversity leads to innovation. And in it, they say that when there's at least one person on the team that is you know, reflective of um, an underserved demographic, that you're hoping to reach, the whole team better understands that under leveraged market opportunity. I think it's funny that you're using that quote because I use that quote all the time. Do you? I do. I do. We should go on the road yeah. with our floral dresses <laughs> and our but matching it's true, quotes. Right? Even just, just one person, yeah. just one person on the team helps that entire team to understand um, how to better serve your audience. Absolutely. And we saw that. We saw that with every hire. Um, and so once st the story that you're mentioning, cultural appropriation, which we called cultural appreciation, was kind of an interesting case study in that. Um, and also recognizing when even the most diverse team, or in our case, masthead, can't always tell the stories as, as we can't always tell the story better than someone from the community that we're hoping to reflect. Sometimes it's about passing the mic and amplifying the voices from the community and lending your platform to them. And so this was an example of that where we, so we saw online on social media every season, especially around Coachella and New York Fashion Week, Teen Vogue among many other magazines and designers were being called out for cultural appropriation. Do you all know what cultural appropriation is? Some cops are like, <clears throat> no. So basically, it is, in a nutshell, it's just appropriating. Um, it's, when, it's when the um, sort of, uh, it's basically when you appropriate uh, beauty looks or fashion looks that, are, that have originated in a marginalized community. And so you see it happen all the time. You see you know, headdresses being worn at Coachella. You see bindis being worn at, you know, on, on runways. And so we had to have a conversation internally with our team and say, we had to address the issue to make sure that we stop becoming culprits every season. And we had to create a safe environment for people to ask questions like, why is it wrong to put cornrows on a Caucasian girl with blonde hair? It's just celebrating that culture. Why is that wrong? Or, you know, we had to really unravel this issue to, to make sure that everyone on the team understood the nuances of it, why it was triggering and, and offensive to many people in our audience. And then we, once we all kind of got more on the same page, we recognized that we had an, a responsibility to our community to address it and to hopefully um, contribute something productive to this very controversial, very contentious conversation about race and identity. And so what came out of that meeting and that very hard conversation, very uncomfortable conversation for some people, was um, a story that we called cultural appreciation, where we tapped real girls from routinely uh, appropriated communities, marginalized communities, and we asked them to come and let us shoot them in their sort of natural beauty. And we also ask them to explain on camera the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. We ask them to talk about what these beauty looks meant in their culture. And it was a risky move for a brand that had been routinely called out for cultural appropriation. Right. We could have very easily got a ton of backlash. It was, it was scary, but the whole team went into it together 
And so our, it's important that your wins are together, your losses are together, you move forward as a team. And that's exactly what we did. We had a Native American girl named Donette come with her sort of like three or four foot feather that no one on set could touch and she educated us about it and educated the world through our, through our platform. And I, I can't tell you how good it felt when that story came out and it made waves in our community. It, it became a Twitter moment when a Twitter moment was a thing back in, I think, 2016. Um, and it really reinforced for our team that this is a direction that we need to continue moving in and we need to continue pushing past what we normally do and we need to throw the old formulas out. Um, and, and, and that is honestly what led us to great success. I just think that, but that's a, such a special example because it was one of the first times that we'd ever gone in this direction. Um, and it really did start from having those hard conversations internally. Yeah, and I feel like for all of us here in the room, you know, we all work at companies where those voices exist, mm -hmm. right? They do. And uh, when we stop and, and take a breath and, and actually make space to allow those voices to emerge, mm -hmm. um, those are your storytellers, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't always have to be your customers and audience. And I think we um, so often forget uh, when we are so customer driven or we're so user driven that we forget that um, our employees are the ones here first and foremost right, making those experiences for the people that we want to reach. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we center our employees and their stories and their experiences and really use that as a, a source of power um, to drive the organization forward? Yeah, I thought your example actually that you shared backstage was really interesting um, and profound around um, how a company that you formerly worked for, if you want to share the story, yeah. um, addressed the Black Lives Matter conversation and how that ended up being a, a moment of awakening for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, summer of 2016, uh, a moment that I, I will never forget when, uh, you know, after the death of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling um, at the hands of um, uh, law enforcement, uh, a lot, a quite a few tech companies came out um, it, publicly to talk about, um, you know, racial injustices and, and for the first time really um, kind of taking a stance. Uh, and, you know, for me to, to kind of usher the company that I was with through that moment, um, my moment of truth was realizing um, just how isolating it was, uh, that it was, um, a really scary place that I've never gone uh, before for myself and, and realizing that when I looked around at the leaders that I was trying to explain what this movement is about, what this hashtag stands for, um, that it, it overwhelmed me in ways that I, I can't even really explain. Mm -hmm. But what came out of that is um, just such an incredible strong conviction for me that as we move along in our journeys, it is so incredibly important to create communities. Mm -hmm. um, you hear so often, I think, from um, women, people of color, that as they move up the ranks, right, we all know this, the data shows it, uh, that people of color, women of all backgrounds just drop off, right? We go from, you know, something like 38% uh, in entry level, um, all of a sudden to kind of 17%, et cetera, and so on as we move up. Um, we talk about how lonely it is, but the conversation that I feel like we're not having and that we absolutely should be having is, so how do we then build communities each step of the way mm -hmm. and bring people along with us? Mm -hmm. um, and I love the phrase that you've used, which is how do we pass the mic? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about that, about allyship and, and passing the mic. Mm -hmm. um, in this day and age, I think one of the interesting trends in this last year is talking so much about allyship. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to be a good ally? With one minute left on the clock, I will say this. I think we will not always have all the answers, and that's okay. And sometimes our role is to just create space and to create an opportunity for someone else whose, voices have not, whose voice or voices have not been heard to have an opportunity to share their perspective. Um, and to really just hold space for that. I think that is probably one of the most important things that we can do as leaders. And the other thing I would say is to 
you know, when you find yourself looking around at a room of people who look exactly like you or from or familiar to you, I think it's important to recognize that you're in an unconscious bias rut. And the only way to get out of that is to intentionally and consciously break out of the, really, it's human nature to, 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 to gravitate towards people who are like you. Um, but to break out of that and break away from the notion that you know, people need to fit into a corporate culture and, and instead start it's not about a culture fit, it's about hiring for your blind spots. And, um, and then when you do that, creating a sense of belonging, creating an opportunity for those people to share their perspective, and you have to be intentional about it because it's counter to the way we were all socialized, and we're all a part of the problem, and we can all be a part of the solution. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this wonderful Thank conversation. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.